Hi, welcome to Nova. In this video, we have some announcements about what's going on in our church community. And then we'll have a time of worship through music, followed by a message from the New Testament book of James. If you visit novachurch.org, you can find some additional resources, like a children's lesson, discussion questions about the sermon, and prayer prompts. And if you'd like to connect with Nova further, you can visit us on Facebook by searching for Nova Community Church or on Instagram at Nova Church. And you can always download our app in the App Store or on Google Play by searching for Nova Community Church. We hope you enjoy today's service. Take care. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Garrett and I am the Director of Local Missions here at NOVA. And my name's Byron and I serve as the church planter for Momentum Christian Fellowship. And thank you for joining us. We are so grateful to be worshiping alongside you today. Whether you're a member of NOVA, Momentum, Gateway Church, or just tuning in, we welcome you. Uh, before we jump into our worship service, we have just a few things we want you to know about. First, after a brief hiatus due to the stay-at-home order, our Laundry Love Ministry is back. That's right. This past Saturday, some of the leaders of Laundry Love passed out baggies filled with quarters, laundry pods, dryer sheets, and a few snacks outside of a local laundromat to those who are in need. Now, perhaps more than ever in recent history, more and more people are in need. And therefore, we are so very grateful for ministries like Laundry Love. So if you'd like to uh, support this ministry, there are a few ways to do so. You can drop off quarters, laundry pods, not detergent, but pods, mm -hmm. and dryer sheets at Nova. Just make sure that you call the office first to make sure someone's there. The number is 310-371-1274. Or you can give monetarily either via Tithely or you can mail a check to Nova. Uh, just make sure you write Laundry Love in the memo. All of that info can be found at novachurch.org slash giving. So we as a staff have also been preparing for when we're able to gather again in person for our Sunday morning worship services. Now we're not exactly sure when that will be yet, but what we do know is we are going to need all of your help in a big way. That's right, to make our in-person gatherings happen, we're going to be recruiting te teams of people to help out, and we need all of you. We're going to need people to help with setup, with parking, with ushering, as restroom monitors, in the children's ministry, mm -hmm. and in a few other areas as well. So please be thinking and praying about helping out for whenever and however we are able to gather for an in-person worship service again. Like Dean said in last week's update video, two things need to happen before we gather. One, we need clearance from local authorities to gather, and two, we are going to need help from all of you. So stay tuned in the future for what that will look like. And as always, if you have any prayer requests, you can send those to prayer at novachurch.org. There's a, a team of Nova people who will get those uh, requests and, and keep you in prayer. And please keep supporting Nova's ministries. You can do so by physically mailing in your tithe or you can give online. All of that information can be found at novachurch.org slash giving. And with that, we love you, we miss you, but we're also happy to be worshiping with you in this space. So take care, everyone. I wanna take just a moment and welcome you to this time of worship. As we move into a time of worshiping through song, I wanna share something good from the prophet Micah. In Micah 6, verse eight, we read, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It is good to be together, worshiping together. It's hard to walk humbly with our God alone. That's one of the beautiful things about being a part of God's church. And that's good too. As you worship today, may you be listening for his voice. After all, he's the one who shows you what is good. Let God tell you about his kingdom so that you can seek it. Let God reveal his justice so that you can learn and repeat it. Let God show you his mercy again and again. And may you worship him knowing that it is because of his mercy that you do so. I encourage you to let your worship flow out of something good. 
letting God know that you want to walk with Him humbly, closely, and daily.
Hey Nova family, I hope you're doing well. I'd also like to give a shout out to a couple churches joining us during this time. Welcome to Momentum Christian Fellowship and Gateway Church. And there are others joining us from places like Arizona and Minnesota and Virginia and Hawaii. Welcome to all of you. Please turn your Bibles or your devices or your phones to the New Testament book of James chapter one. I think I know just a little about what it felt like being the younger brother. You see, I'm the youngest in my family. And my sister and brother were smart and they followed all the rules and they were popular among their friends. And when you have successful and overachieving older siblings, it's hard to be the younger brother. But it had to be really tough for James though. It's tough when your older brother says, I'm the son of God and your mom and dad believe him. That's tough. You know, my daughter celebrated her birthday last week, and one of the things we often do in our family is we tell the story of the day of your birth on your birthday. 
Now, can you imagine what it would be like if they had the same family tradition on Jesus' birthday? Mom says, well, an angel came and told me that I was pregnant with the Son of God. And Dad says, you know, I had a dream too, and an angel told me the same story. Goes on to say, Jesus, you were born in the little town of Bethlehem in a barn, and we laid you in a feeding trough. A group of sheep herders showed up and looked around and said, yep, this is just like the angel told us it would be. And then later, some magi, some wise men, said that a star led them to the baby, and they brought the most expensive gifts. But for a younger brother, it must have been tough growing up in the same family as Jesus. What would you do if people said your older brother was demon-possessed? What would you do if Crowds of people followed your older brother around, just hoping to get a glimpse of him or see him perform a miracle or have his healing hands touch you. And the gossip and the rumors got so bad that you and your mom and your siblings tried to do an intervention, but were turned away. Despite what Jesus said and how he lived, they didn't believe him. And maybe this led to a lot of family dysfunction and strained relationships. We read in the gospel accounts that at the cross, at the end of Jesus' life, the family's not there. They were absent, except for mom. She's there to witness her oldest son's death. And then something radical happens three days later. Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he said what he said about being the son of God was true. Let's take a look at the first chapter of a book that was written by James, the younger brother of Jesus. In verse 1, it begins this way. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This is God's word for us today. Let's start with an introduction to the book of James. What we see here in the book of James, it's it's a letter where theological principles are applied in very practical ways. The book of James is unique in that it takes the teachings of Jesus and helps us to understand how then shall we live. Who is James anyways? Well, James was the leader of the mother church, the church at Jerusalem. And James is unique Because if there's anyone who knows you inside out, if there is anyone who's going to see your faults, it's who you live with, especially your little brother. In verse 1, James calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But James didn't always see himself this way. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 7, verse 5, it says, For even Jesus' own brothers did not believe him. And then we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to mostly groups of people, but Jesus made a very special appearance for his younger brother. In verse 3, in the middle, it says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then in verse 7, it says, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Historians tell us that in 62 AD, some enemies of the gospel saw that the Jerusalem church was growing rapidly and they grabbed Pastor James and took him to the highest point on the roof of the temple. And they challenged him to renounce his belief that Jesus was the son of God. And when he refused, they brutally took his life, even as he prayed for the forgiveness of his murderers. Well, who was the book of James written to? A few weeks ago, Pastor Byron brought a message from Acts chapter 8 where a great persecution broke out among the Jerusalem church. 
It goes on to say, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. We see that James writes to the same group of people. In James chapter 1, in verse 1, right in the middle, it says, to the 12 tribes scattered. This is the same group of people here. And James is writing a circular letter to people who were scattered and persecuted and sharing the good news wherever God led them. If you were with us in our last series, we called it Life Interrupted, we looked throughout the Bible at the stories of people having their, dis having their life disrupted in uncomfortable ways. And now we're talking about facing trials and troubles again. And you might be asking, doesn't the Bible have any good news? Well, the Bible's about real life. And if you're currently living a life where you're not suffering in some way for your faith, you are part of an incredible lucky few. The strange thing is that you and I tend to turn it the other way around, that when you suffer, you think you're part of the unfortunate few. Throughout the scriptures, we see the promises of God or the free forgiveness for sins and, and eternity with Jesus. It's not a rose garden here on earth. And even if you are part of the incredible lucky few and your life is like a beautiful rose garden, you will inevitably find a few thorns. So let's take a look at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, where we're going to discover the purpose of trials and troubles. In verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. The first point we can make here is that troubles are inevitable. Now, James does not tell us, consider it pure joy if you face trials of many kinds. He tells us to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Our current culture goes against this. And for some reason, most people think that they don't deserve hard times. The reason people of our current culture don't think they deserve trials and tribulation is because you and I live in a secular culture. The word secular comes from the Latin word seculum, which means now. A secular culture teaches you that you can get it all now. All your happiness and experiences and fulfillment and stuff now, because this is it, there is no tomorrow. You know, there has never been a culture that had set people up to be so vulnerable to the troubles of life. Every other culture, ancient or modern, taught people that there is this earthly life and then there is another life. People regularly thought, you can have love here, but one day you're going to experience real love. You can get rich now, but in another life later, you'll get real riches. So ask yourself and be honest. In what ways has living in our secular culture affected you? You see, number one, troubles are inevitable. Number two, what troubles can bring? James does not say, hey, enjoy suffering. Have a great time in your troubles. He also does not say, you won't have any joy until your troubles are over. James says, when you learn how to think and learn how to handle trouble, you can find joy in the trouble. In verses two and three, he begins with, consider because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You need to consider what can happen in your life when you suffer. Suffering can bring other things in your life that are not there. In other words, you're, you are not complete until you experience suffering. There are no less than three virtues that I can think of that are sharpened through suffering. The first is humility. You don't know humility without knowing suffering. And you have no idea how weak you are. You have no idea how much you need God without suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul explains how he developed humility. The Apostle Paul, he had great insight and revelations from God that could have made him proud and boastful. But he said in verse 7, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The second virtue that's sharpened through suffering, the first is humility, the second is compassion. Many of you know that because of a painful personal experience with hardship, that you understand the hurt people feel, and it gives you a lot of empathy. And that memory of hardship gives you a compassionate response to hurting people. So you can gain humility, you can gain compassion, and the third virtue that's gained through suffering is faith. When suffering happens in your life, the questions always come up. Questions like, where's God when it hurts? And does God really know what's happening? And does God even care? And I'm so glad that many of you are being drawn back to God because of this time of global pandemic. And your trust in God and your relationship with God is growing. And those who work through the pain and are steadfast through the suffering, you'll find that when it's all over, you'll look back and you'll see that God was present with you and he carried you through. And as you walked the hard road, your character was developed in ways it could not be developed if your journey was easy and pain-free. There is no way to grow in humility and compassion and faith without experience, tr experiencing trials and trouble. Consider it pure joy because a testing of your faith produces virtues that cannot be developed in any other way. First thing is troubles are inevitable. Second, there are virtues that troubles can bring. And number three, the third is, when you are troubled, ask for wisdom too. When troubles come, we naturally and we quickly ask for relief, but we seldom ask for wisdom. In James chapter one, verse five, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom when you're suffering, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Ask for both wisdom in the trouble and relief from the trouble. We tend to be really good at asking for relief and not so good at asking for wisdom. And a perfect example of asking for both relief and wisdom is found in Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, the place that he went to pray before the anguish of the cross. When he went there to pray, he was deeply distressed and troubled, and he was desperate and anxious at the thought of what lie before him. And he prayed, deliver me from my trouble. If there's any other way other than going to the cross, please make it happen. But he also prayed, Father, yet not what I will, but what you will. So get this, Jesus is asking for wisdom and insight. And Jesus prays, I want relief, but I also want wisdom. I want to understand your will and your way. And that is the prayer of wisdom. God, what can I learn from my troubles and what should I do? Okay, so I know that troubles are inevitable and I know that the way to develop humility and compassion and faith is through suffering. And I naturally ask for relief from the trouble, but now I know to ask for wisdom. So what's the secret? What's the key to dealing with trials and troubles and suffering? It's perseverance, it's endurance, it's steadfastness. James says, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The word perseverance comes from a Greek word, hypomeno. Hypo or hyper means super, and meno means to stand. It means to superstand. And that's why we're calling this series Steadfast. Whatever comes at us in life, suffering or not, we're to be steadfast. And when we are tested, we will develop humility and compassion and faith. And in the midst of suffering, we'll ask for relief and for wisdom. There is one who is steadfast for you, though. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 3, it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 2 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, meaning 
he was steadfast, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross, and he said, my love for the people I'm seeking to save is steadfast. They, they can destroy my body, but I will persevere. The reason we know that the love of Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us is because he was steadfast in the midst of suffering on the cross. Remember, Pastor James, the younger half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, knew what it was like to live with Jesus. They shared meals, they maybe even shared chores, maybe even a bedroom and a bathroom. And he begins his letter that is written to the church that's been scattered because of suffering and persecution. And he exhorts the people that are hurting and troubled and going through trials to endure and to persevere and to be steadfast. The Apostle Paul explains to us the purpose for suffering in this good word, this benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as we close our time together. In verse 16, he writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. May God bless you and make you steadfast in him as you consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds.